Hey, welcome back YouTube or wherever you're watching this. Um, we are here today with Jason Andre of the Mid-Atlantic and we're gonna talk to him a little bit about our current uh, landscape, what's going on and how, um, how they're doing in this interesting time of ours. So welcome Jason and I'll let you kind of introduce yourself and tell us a little bit about who you are and what you do. Thank you. Yeah, my name is Jason Andre, and I am the lead singer, mandolin, guitar, didgeridoo, bagpipe player for the Mid-Atlantic. We are a uh, folk rock Americana band based here in the Cape Fear region, and we play a lot of festivals, we play a lot of weddings, we sometimes play some punk rock when we get a little uh, uncomfortable in the slow acoustic realm. Um, but yeah, that's, that's who I am. Awesome. Well, well, thank you for, for joining me. Um, you did, well, I think you left out a couple things there that I think are really cool that you do. You also have a kid's album and kind of a kid's band that I just wanted to plug because I think it's awesome. Tell me about that too. Yeah, thanks, man. Yeah, uh, we took a break from the Mid-Atlantic for about a year, and uh, in that time I wrote a kid's album called Sea Songs for Little Pirates, and it's all marine biology, pirate-themed kid songs that are also adult-friendly, adult-tolerable, and um, it's basically the same guys that are in the Mid-Atlantic who helped me uh, put, the, put the underwater creature band together. Um, so, yeah, that's... That's super fun. Yeah, if, um, if you're watching this and you ever get a chance to go see that live, whenever um, those sorts of things can happen again, you should because it's a whole, like there's costumes, <laughs> there's themes, it's, it's a lot of fun. Um, and if you have kids, it's a no brainer for them too. Cool, anyway, so now that that's uh, established, um, what, I, what I really want to talk to you today, I guess, is your, um, your experience in the events world, because that's, that's kind of where uh, this platform is, is based and geared to. So I did want to ask you um, some questions here that I've got. Um, and the first one is, this is kind of going to be coronavirus related. There's really no way to get around that topic right now here at the end of May. Um, in 2020. So I wanted you to talk a little bit about how, um, just I guess broadly, how has the, the COVID-19 situation impacted your band and how you guys operate? So we had quite a few festivals and small local concerts, as well as a handful of weddings booked this year um, which is pretty standard and one by one we saw the festivals especially the spring festivals canceling once everything started to get serious um, weddings obviously started getting canceled and you know we part of part of the beauty of what we do is that we started out as a band that just wanted to play music and you know I've been a songwriter most of my life and the brand of music that we play inherently became very uh, sought after for weddings so that Americana folk bluegrass style um, people wanted something different for their wedding they didn't just want a DJ they didn't just want like a cover band so we found ourselves in the wedding industry, uh, which I was familiar with coming from the videography world. I have my own photography and videography business. And so I actually got my my start, cut my teeth filming wedding videos. Um, so I, I knew the industry and I knew a lot of the people in the industry locally. And so it became a pretty fun, cool way to continue to, you know, spend time with my peers and, and friends that are still in the wedding industry and the events industry. Um, but we, we did more than just weddings. We, we did private events as well, corporate events. Um, and it was a really nice way to actually make some money playing music because just being a regular band playing festivals and 
even playing local shows, like you don't make a lot of money um, unless you are busting your tail, touring, putting out an album every year or two. And we all have full-time jobs and now a couple of the guys have kids and that's, you know, we're all pretty much married except for one of the guys. And that's, that's a lot of hometown commitments that you can't really, um, just run off on tour with if you're not already successful in the music industry and doing that. So, or willing to sacrifice a lot in order to do that. Um, so yeah, did that answer the question? (laughs) Well, yeah, I mean, I think that places us kind of understanding, um, what you guys do and, and the different things you service, I guess the, well, with respect to our current situation, I guess, you know, anything you had, I'm assuming here on the books for 2020 has been either postponed or scrapped as far as weddings. Is that correct? Yeah, I had one, one wedding that, uh, basically got, didn't get canceled, but it actually got moved up. Um, they were having a lot of friends and family coming into town. They had the whole band booked. And then I got a call and they said, look, it's just going to be her family and my family. We're going to be in the backyard. We'd still love you to come play. We'll keep you on the porch. We'll keep everybody away from you. We'll all wear, you know, masks um, (laughs) if we need to. And so I, I was actually able to play one private wedding from... 100 feet away, 200 feet away from the actual uh, wedding ceremony up on a porch while they were in the backyard. Um, So that was interesting. But that's, I mean, that was pretty much it. Everything else, I think there's some hopeful brides for the fall, but I think that just is going to depend on how this summer goes. I don't, I don't know how long we can all survive, you know, as as professionals in this industry, if we go an entire year without anything, um, that's, that's going to kill a lot of businesses. Um, but the, the cost is the, the weight and the balance is always kind of in, in limbo. So we've gotten some, some requests for 2021, and 2022 (laughs) like i don't know what i'm gonna be doing in two years i don't even know if i'm gonna have a band in two years so that's you know it's a little weird um just basically having 2020 not happen yeah and i think um as as we kind of go along this has been kind of interesting i think this is the fourth interview i've done um and I've, i've been doing them you know kind of once a week and even just in that amount of time you know, so much has changed, not necessarily, I guess, with what the virus is doing, but how people are thinking about it. And I think that's a really interesting thing. And, and I want to keep doing these because I, you know, if I can continue to do them, uh, you'll see like this response kind of change. And right now, the conversation that I'm noticing seems to be like, OK, um, how do we get back to work? Because we need to. And if we don't, you know, this business, this business, this business is not going to make it or they're going to have to, you know, pivot to something else, um, which is just strange um, and unnerving for everyone. So I think that's really interesting that the conversation has now, from how I view it, changed from like we need to take every precaution to some people are starting to like, you know, venture out and, you know, with, with the phasing openings of, of different states and North Carolina's in phase two now. So we see more and more stuff opening more and more, um, you know, people wanting to get back to normal, but there's still this obviously like (laughs) ominous cloud over everything. Yeah. There's, there's no, there's no more normal, like the normal that we knew does not exist anymore, nor do I think will it exist in the coming year because the reality is we're all getting back to the things we were doing before, but the virus isn't gone. It hasn't disappeared. We haven't flattened the curve. Like 
all the measures that we've taken over the past three or four months are basically null and void now that everything's opening back up. Like we, we, we pumped the brakes and I don't know, man, like I, I, and I'm, I'm not one to be paranoid or, or fear certain things, but at the same time, we are still going to have to take the same precautions that we've been taking. It's just going to be, you know, everybody, (laughs) we're all going to be getting sick (laughs) essentially. Like it's, I don't know, man. It's it's such a. <sighs> These are tough questions to answer, um, yeah. especially as it changes, because it's you know nobody knows what the future is going to be. Um, we just know it's going to be different than what it is now and what we knew it to be in the past. So um, yeah. I don't think there's a right <laughs> or wrong answer right now. No, it's all up in the air, man. And you know one of the, one of the things that that's super frustrating for me is even even the guys in the band like we haven't gotten together to play like we've all been self-isolated for the most part and but you know two of them have babies that are less than a year old um the uh, one of our other guys has a young kid uh with his partner and you know, everyone's really been sticking to their own bubble. And so like, we haven't been able to get together and practice even, even at a distance, you know, like we're, we're not just being responsible for ourselves. We're being responsible for our spouses, for our kids, for our parents. Like my dad's coming down in a couple days to visit. And so I'm like, I kind of got to stay away from everybody and, and kind of put myself back into a, a lockdown because then he's obviously going to go back and see my mom and she's got health issues so it's you know nothing nothing has changed the virus hasn't changed the virus hasn't gone away the, you know it, it's really frustrating and it's not anybody's fault and that's you know kind of the thing that I try to keep in the back of my mind like there's it's a virus a virus is a virus you can't point the finger at anybody and say this is your fault are there measures that could have been taken on a global federal national state local level to protect us or you know kind of curb things sure but the reality is this has happened in history before and you can't stop it like you're just gonna have to deal with it and make life changes, I suppose, that um, put you at less of a risk. So it's super frustrating, I guess was my point. Like, I can't even practice with my buddies, you know, the guys in the band. You guys don't do any, like, Zoom jam sessions? (laughs) That doesn't really work, huh? (laughs) Have you? Never mind. I was going to ask you if you've ever tried to, like... Yeah, let's let's try it real quick. All right, I'm gonna I'm gonna make a rhythm, and you make a rhythm, and see if we can synchronize the rhythm. No, it's not working. <laughs> it's just like a bunch of white people trying to keep their rhythm together, you know. It's in a in a normal setting, so yeah, that doesn't work. <laughs> the technology is good. It's not that good. Yeah, we need to. We've got to somehow prevent all lag. Um. We did. Um, Right when everything kind of went down, we were getting ready to uh, enter NPR's Tiny Desk Contest. So oh. so I took one of our new songs and I, I played it through, just me and my mandolin singing. And then I sent that to all the guys and they put it in their ears and, and recorded themselves playing their parts. So that was cool. That, you know, that's one way to keep up with, you know, keep your fingers busy and keep playing the songs, but that requires, that still, you know, that requires a lot of, lot more time than just getting together. And then, you know, you got to edit it all together. And, um, and there's a lot of bands that are doing that and it's, it's fun, but at the same time, it's, it's not the same as getting together and synchronizing and, you know, it's just not the same. Yeah. I think, um, you know, there's, this is, this is a project you know, in that same vein for me, because I don't have, you know, my normal workload. So just trying to figure out 
something to do that could potentially be helpful or productive to, to keep, <laughs> like you said, my fingers moving, my mind occupied, but it's not sustainable. Like, it, and it is super frustrating to just not have any answers to when, when and how um, we can, we can do our jobs or live our lives like we want to. Um, yeah, yeah, it's hard to sit still. Like, uh -huh. uh, I was saying it's hard. It's hard to to be still. It's hard to sit still. It's hard to not want to like, for especially for creatives like your mind's always rolling. And I think that but th that may be an advantage for us is to, and for the whole wedding industry in, in that regard, whether you're a florist or you're an event planner, like being creative is an advantage in this particular time because you can, I mean, you can do to some extent kind of anything. Like you can kind of get your brain moving and, and start to get, real weird <laughs> if you want and you know start exploring some things that maybe you didn't have time to do before um sure. you know like with the kids album stuff i can't go out and play kids shows but i bought a green screen and some puppets and i'm gonna start my own youtube channel at some point and uh <laughs> put out some super weird guar for kids music videos <laughs> You'll have to send me a clip so I can overlay it here um, <laughs> to illustrate this. But yeah, that's a great point. And that's something that I have heard from from other people that I've talked to is that um, it the space is not, you know, nobody wants to be in this position, but it's allowing people to um, either work on things in their business that they haven't had time to do. I, I've heard that come up a lot or um, just work on things that they've never thought to do because they're, you know, they have time to think, they have time to, to be creative. And you're right, most of the people that land in the events industry seem to be creative minded <clears throat> in some way. So yeah, I agree with you there. Um, I feel like our conversation, like I have my my list of questions here um, that I kind of wrote, like I, I tried to customize these a bit for, for what you do, but um, you've answered some of this stuff and I think some of it is just not as relevant, but I'll try to, um, let me pick one here. Uh, so you said there's not gonna be, you know, any going back to normal the way we, we were um, before this. In respect to events, and I guess weddings in particular, how do you think, what are some things that you think might change that, that will be you know, in the short term, but then also long term in, in terms of, um, I guess the overall event, but also in respects to entertainment? I feel like at some point, and it may be in two years, it may be in three years, maybe in five years, I think things will eventually get back to some semblance of normalcy. Um, I think in the short term, in the next year or two, you're going to see smaller events. You're going to see smaller weddings, smaller gatherings. People aren't going to feel as bad about trimming down their <laughs> their guest list. Um, you know, budgets are going to be tighter because people, you know, are, have lost jobs, lost money. Um, so I, I think it's all it's all kind of whittling down into kind of bare bones um, events, and I think eventually once we have a vaccine, perhaps, and people feel more comfortable being around each other and being around strangers, and you know, there's this any any time I go out, like if I have to go to the hardware store. Um, there's this weird like polar demagnetization that's happening with people like you're not even that close but i've seen it so many times where like you're walking and like two people lock eyes and they're like trying to get around <laughs> each other you know i i don't think it'll be like that at events cuz i've seen families together and even close friends like there's this and i i'm guilty of it too there's this kind of dropping of your guard when you're near a close friend like oh this is my good friend like they're not gonna have covid so i can i can get in a little closer or i can you know 
Like, I haven't seen this guy in two years. And, you know, one of my buddies is in town right now. And he's he lives by himself. He's been by himself. He works from home. He drove out here to the East Coast to see his family. And his family's been pretty locked down. And he, like, comes in for a big hug. And I'm like, man, this, this feels really good. <laughs> not, not to be awkward with my buddy, but, you know... And I didn't say that out loud, but like, <laughs> oh, it just, you know, it just felt good to hug my friend. And then, you know, we get talking and he's like, oh yeah, I went to this house party the other day. I'm like, you jackass. What? Like you're home with your parents, you know, one of which also has health issues and come on, man. <laughs> like I thought I was safe. And then I've come to find out he wasn't using protection. <laughs> well, that's a good lesson. Like you can't, you just can't assume what someone has been up to and you can't assume that the people they've been up to whatever they were up to with have been up to and it's just kind of this that's what makes it so challenging and and scary uh and you know especially for people that that have you know not not just you or i but um you know people that we know in our family that that are compromised in some way or elderly and you you just that that to me is like such a scary thought is like, you know, not being uh, symptomatic and then seeing someone like my parents or, or somebody like that and then just yeah. having it, you don't know. So with with weddings, we actually had a, a lead today um, and they've been few and far between, but it's a small wedding. It's basically ceremonial and that's kind of all we can do right now. And they want, they want a video and they want a live stream and I get all that, but I'm gonna have a conversation with the planner uh, this afternoon just to like, okay, like give me the details, like what's going on here. And I haven't, I haven't done anything like that. I haven't worked um, since the, you know, this went on. I haven't used a camera other than to do this really. So um, going into a wedding environment, a social environment where people are going to, you know, inherently let their guard down because they're around people they love and it's a big day for them. I'm curious as to what that's going to look like. And even though I can, I can control, you know, I'm kind of an outsider here. I can look at this, um, you know, from a, from a non, um, what's the word I'm looking for? I'm, I'm not connected to these people. So I can, I can film and step back, but I'm curious to see how people act. Just seeing how that works. And I guess it would be limited to 20, it's supposed to be outside, so I guess 25 people max, but 25 people is a lot of people, especially like close, you know, I have a feeling they're gonna be close and they're gonna hug and they're gonna kiss and they're gonna do all that stuff and then they're gonna go and do their life. And yeah. that's interesting. Yeah. <laughs> well, if I, if I were you, I, I would sell all of your wide angle lenses and just invest in a bunch of 200 millimeters and just shoot everything. Just gonna <laughs> snipe. Yeah, I'm gonna be in the bushes. No, I think it is good. I'm, I hope we get the wedding, number one. I'd like to earn some income, but uh, you know, I would, I'm also just kinda, I think I'm adept enough to cover it without having to be right on top of people. I, I can shoot that way and still create something cool. And I think it's obviously, st if you're still gonna go on with your wedding right now or plan your wedding your ceremony, I definitely think it's worth recording it, especially right now, um, because yeah. so many people can't attend it. And that's why they're looking into the live stream option, which is like a whole nother skill set that, that we're learning now and trying to figure out and got all these dongles and hotspot setups and, you know, because my, my biggest fear, like weddings to me always present this huge, like fear, like I have fever dreams, you know, the night before wedding was like, oh, what if I don't hit record? Or what if the battery dies during the ceremony? Or, anxiety. Yeah, and now I'm like, well, what if the internet connection goes out and it drops the feed? You know, there's no recourse for that. So it's just like, I'm just gonna like arm up with as many dongles as possible. <laughs> And try to to bring a laptop to a wedding ceremony, and also stay creative, and ju it's just like it's a whole another level of stuff, and, and the try to be safe, and it's just a lot to to think about. But you've got to earn money too. I don't, 
know the answer to these questions. Um, yeah. Well, I, I think you got it right, man. It's again, it goes back to being creative, like finding new ways to, to do things. And maybe out of that, you get this whole new format or this whole new style of doing it. And then, you know, the other thing with anything audio visual is redundancy, like have a backup for your backup and have a backup plan for your backup plan. And, you know, that way you never get caught with your with your pants down and no dongle. <laughs> it's a bad place to be. <laughs> well, the other thing is like needing more people. It's like, okay, well, if you want me to do this and film it the way I would normally do and then live stream, like I have to bring more people into the environment, which is like the, this like number restriction also applies to the vendors you're bringing. So it's like, okay, well, you're asking for more services that are more challenging to, to have happen or to create. I need, I can't do that by myself. So it's like this, this is weird. So, um, I, that leads me to another question. Um, maybe you, you've had some experience with this, but basically each inquiry or each scenario, I've kind of had to jump on the phone, whether that's postponements, cancellations, new inquiries, because it seems like it's everything is kind of a case by case basis. Have you noticed any of that or can you speak to any of that? Uh, yeah, I mean, Again, you know, some of the some of the leads that we've gotten are for 2022 and I part of me there's this like dark part of me that's like, man, nothing's ever going to be back to normal. I'm never going to play another show again. We're never going to book anything ever again like the world's going down. <laughs> we're we're burning it down and but I, I don't let that voice talk for very long. So I get back on the email. And <laughs> I, uh, you know, I, I said, we, we don't usually book that far out, maybe a year. Um, and then for brides, they're like, hey, we want to postpone till the fall. Like, OK. So they start asking us for dates. I give them a couple dates. You know, uh, yeah, we're available in September, I guess, maybe. Um, and then they say, okay, we booked it for October 16th. <laughs> like, wait, those weren't the dates that we were talking about. <laughs> I guess we'll try to make it work. Um, and, uh, and then as far as like festivals and, and other, other performance events, 2020 has been canceled. I mean, it's, there's nothing. I, I don't, I don't see us getting back to concerts and things like that until next year, until everyone's gotten the virus and gotten over it or died from it, or we have a vaccine that will, you know, make everybody feel comfortable to go back out in public again. So, yeah, definitely case by case basis. Um, and, and then again, like I'm not getting that many inquiries either. Like I'm not getting that many leads. Um, so, cause who's going to hire five people or four people in a band to come into their private space of 25 people, you know, it's just not going to happen. So the solo thing is an option, but even that comes with its challenges and I, it may provide the opportunity for me to kind of rebolster the solo thing again, even though the other guys want to play, like we all want to play together. Um, but yeah, I don't know, man. Yeah. I was, I was going to ask about that. Um, if you know, we're, we're talking about events of 10 to, you know, 20, 25 people. I feel like that you can do a, a smaller, you know, entertainment package, right? Like even acoustic, you can play for that many people and it feel appropriate. So, um, that was something in thinking about this interview, I was curious as to, um, if you've done one of those, which sounds like, do you have any video of that by the way? Um, I don't, I don't have any video of it. There was, there was a photographer there and 
she was wearing a mask the whole time and kind of, you know, keeping, keeping distant, but no, I don't think I have any video. You know, that could be a very viable thing that, you know, and thinking, okay, people are going to have a ceremony. That seems to be the prerogative. Then they generally, it seems like want to have like some sort of dinner thing, but the entertainment, like the reception part of the event is where like, there's just so many questions and it just seems like events are shorter. Like the lead I got is asking for four hours. So I'm assuming that's like an hour of like getting ready an hour for the ceremony, an hour for like a cocktail hour type thing. And then like, yeah. I'm curious as to see what they have planned. But, you know, I think there is room in that kind of timeline for someone, a smaller thing. Like, I feel like a DJ is almost like too much for that, you know? Yeah. Yeah. I see where you're going with that. I, and I agree. I, I think we may see a trend or a shift into a more dialed down reception where it's just more intimate. It's more conversation. It's less of a party. It's more of a, you know, just a, a gentle celebration of, of the people's life, maybe a little more intimate. And that's just how it's going to be for a while. We've also like, uh, I've talked to a few people about like people have different priorities for their wedding. Like, some people that want a 200, 300 person event and having the full reception and party are never, they're not gonna go for that. That's, and they're just gonna postpone until they can do that. But some people are, you know, maybe we're planning on having a 50 or 60 person wedding anyway. And they're like, okay, well we can, we can do 25. I guess. You know, we could still keep to that. We just need to like tweak some things going forward. So I think it's all gonna kind of come down to what people's priorities are, what their, you know, ideals are for their wedding and how, you know, important this versus this is when it comes to their plan. And that's always going to be different. Yeah. In, in contrast, the other thing we might see is people just going to the courthouse, getting married. And then whenever everything opens back up, having like a party, a celebration of the marriage, you know, a year later or whatever, you know, because yeah. they, they all want to have that. And I think it's just going to be based on their personality and their timeline and, you know, things like that. So that I think we'll see kind of those two different versions happening. So for for wedding planners, you know, get ready because 2022 is going to be a <laughs> it's going to be a knockout <laughs> if you can survive for two years on no income. Yeah, that's uh... It's so interesting to think about, but I try not to dwell on it because I go to, like you said, I, I kind of end up in some darker spaces in my mind and it's just not healthy. I think to, it's hard to, it's hard for me to shake out of that sometimes. Um, especially like, I feel like work, the way I've gone about working for, you know, as long as I can remember has always been kind of a distraction for me. You know, I've got my list of things to do, you know, or I don't do a nine to five, but it's, I've kind of regimented my life that way. You know, it's, we kind of naturally gravitate to that because it gives us a, a sense of purpose. It gives us something to do every day. It's, you know, a routine we can feel comfortable in, but that has been completely disrupted now. And I find myself, you know, I don't have enough stuff to do <laughs> between nine. Like I'm constantly like, what can I do? What can, you know, what project can I immerse myself in to, to give me that sense of purpose? Do you experience any of that? Or can you speak to, I guess it's the mental health side of the stuff and, and any advice or things that you found effective to, to people that have had their routines disruptive, disrupted and are kind of, trying to find a sense of normal in a time that's just not normal at all. Yeah. Um, for myself, I've never been like super big on meditation. Um, I think in my, in my former years, I, you know, prayed, um, and kind of now in this stage of my life, I find that being outside is, just the most amazing therapy, you know, being in the woods, being on the water, near the water, just listening to the birds. And then like some sort of meditation of 
just being still, being quiet, but not allowing my mind to go into the dark places, but instead kind of training my, my, my brain to think of ways to be better, to be a better human being, to just be still, to observe the things around me in more detail, looking, you know, looking at the different shades of green of the different color leaves of the trees, picking apart the conversations of the different birds that are, you know, in, in and around me. Um, I know this sounds kind of hippy dippy, (laughs) but you know, that's, that's just kind of the better place to go for me because yeah, I mean, every, I think everyone has those same thoughts and it's what you do with them and how deep you allow yourself to go with them that makes the difference. So when you find yourself there, um, go for a walk, get your, get your body moving, get yourself breathing. Um, you know, I'm a free diver as well and a surfer. So being in the ocean is my happy place. It's my calm place. When you, when you're being enveloped by the ocean, you know, that's, that's my thunder blanket, (laughs) you know? So just even being, being out there and being active, I think gets certain chemicals and certain things moving in your body that, that not necessarily distract you because I don't, I don't think being busy is necessarily a great way to, and no offense, a great way to deal with, with, with that emotional state. Maybe it is. Um, but it's, it's a heck of a lot better than going on social media and, you know, scrapping through the dumpster fire trash that's on there, which, you know, gosh, man, it's amazing how something so cool where we can be in such close touch with friends around the world. And I've, you know, I've been fortunate enough to travel the world and I've got friends in countries and continents, you know, all over and to be able to like connect immediately with them versus, you know, writing letters back for the internet and social media. Um, it's, it's kind of a miracle, like for someone to have had that idea, like, hey, I want to be able to see your face and talk to you in real time on the other side of the planet. Like who, who even considered that a possibility? And then for the human, the human machine to develop all the little intricate parts to like, that's the kind of stuff, too, that my brain like just starts going haywire with is just the interconnectivity of the entire universe and the planet um i get pretty tripped out on that stuff Um, so that's a fun place to go too but you know just we take that all for granted and then we take that and we take that um platform or platforms and turn it negative and point the finger and call names and you know it's it's like it's like watching elementary school bullies just throwing mud at each other all day long and you know we were already in a pretty tumultuous divisive situation already and then to be hit by a, a global flu you know like this isn't the first time we've experienced as a human race a flu or a plague and you know in all the times that we've dealt with that how have we not learned and figured out how to just be decent people through all of it social media i i've talked to to one other person about that too and that was their like final thought piece of advice is just like maybe not <laughs> do that they were they were saying you know as as business owners like mo- all the people i'm talking to are, are small business owners so like from that standpoint even like if you're engaging in that sort of stuff it's not it's not the best look for your business one way or the other um yeah it doesn't matter which side of the fence you're on like and it's it's so hard to not engage in it because it's like it's just 
there's so much crazy stuff going on, but um, I have I have a definite problem with like not even uh, engaging, but it's hard to look away. It's it's like a incredible explosion, but it's just kind of toxic. Uh, and I think most people can see that and understand the reasons behind it. But it's like so addictive. It's it's like the most addictive thing I've ever come across is Facebook, Twitter, Instagram. TikTok, you know, like they're just immersive. And the great thing about them is that everybody you know is on it. The worst thing about them is that everybody you know is on it. And they're saying things that are just like, what did they say? You know, like it's hard to to turn that off and look away, but um, it might be the, the best thing you can do right now. Yeah. I mean, so look for this on Facebook, Instagram, and YouTube. <laughs> Yeah, I you know, I find myself observing a lot. I <laughs> I unfriended my dad about three times and uh <laughs> try, tried to engage him on some stuff and it just it was never productive and never turned into a productive conversation and you know the thing is people in general and this isn't just my dad, this is literally everybody I think is so I mean obviously everybody has an opinion and everyone gets emotionally riled up when they see an injustice and you know depending on your view of the world depending on your inside and outside influences like those those obviously span a huge cluster of of viewpoints but when you get emotionally riled up in it that's when you start to say and think things that are super inappropriate that you would probably never say face to face with other people whether they agreed with you or didn't agree with you and so you know after a couple of after a couple of super inappropriate things that i did or said i and i i'd held off so long but i again i got trapped in that emotional like God, you you have to stop sharing this stuff and posting it like just stop and at, at that point, I was like, okay, I, I can't engage at all. And kind of still be like, you can't help but be a casual observer as you're just scrolling through. But yeah, at some point, you just got to turn it off, walk away. And that's, it's hard sometimes. And it's, it's really, I, I wish everyone had the ability to take a step back on a daily basis and look at things objectively without opinion and without emotional investment because I think that the majority of sane people would would find that you know it's not worth it it's not worth getting riled up about because there's nothing there's nothing that we can really do on an individual daily basis except be the best person we can be, be our best selves, try to love one another, and, you know, do something kind for somebody, do something selfless. And, you know, for me, I find that if, again, if I start kind of like finding my way down this dark path, I start thinking like, who else is on this dark path? Who haven't I talked to in a while? Who should I call? I haven't heard from so-and-so in a while, so I'm going to send this person a text, or I haven't spoken with this friend in a while, I'm going to give him a call, just because, no reason, just, you know, because you, you see, or maybe you don't see the people that are dealing with some pretty dark emotional stuff. You have no idea. You have no idea what people are going through, and we're all stressed. This is stressful for everyone. We're all, you know, have some degree of anxiety about work and making a living and you know just seeing our friends and family so you know wh one of the things i i have to keep kind of dialing back to is you have no idea what s someone has been through in the past 24 hours past year past five years um and so the best road you can take is just to be kind be patient be loving like these are all really good qualities that span pretty much every religion in the world <laughs> and there's a reason for that there's a commonality in all that that 
I think if if everyone kind of took that step back and looked objectively and you know didn't think that their opinion was better than everybody else's I think we might be in a better spot and we all may be less likely to go down those dark holes well that about sums it up yeah <laughs> um well I think that that's a great place to end um thank you very much for for taking the time and sharing your thoughts on on our state of events but also a lot more than that I think um as these conversations go on it's you know we can address that but I I I've really valued this conversation and, and thinking about things from a more um, holistic approach and all of what you've shared today was great information. Hopefully folks find it useful. I know I did. So thank you, Jason. I appreciate you, man. Yeah, man. Thanks for having me and uh, give me a call if you ever, <laughs> you ever need me help. Me. If you ever need me to help you dig yourself out of a hole. Sounds good. I will do that. Thank you. <laughs> All right, man. Have a great day.